been really looking forward to being here. This is the sort of this is where I I feel at home with people who uh, are making the social sector work in a tough, complex world. Um, I just want to thank you for coming to a presentation that had the word assessment in it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded, some of you have seen these so-called golden circles. If there are any TED Talk aficionados in the room, you know that the second most watched TED Talk of all time was, it was on this. It's by a guy named Simon Sinek. And he says something that just resonates immediately with any of us who've done this kind of work, is that we, we get mired down in the what. We're constantly churning in the what do we do next, what do we do next, what, what do we do to make, make money, what do we do to serve this, what do we do, da, da, da. And that often <clears throat> we just forget that the answer to the what lies in the why, where we go back and say, why do we even exist? Why is our organization on earth? And sometimes the, uh, the what's kind of handle themselves when you, in your, with your colleagues, just go back to say, just hang on a minute, let's just talk about, let's revisit the why. I want to be sure you understand my why for coming to spend the afternoon with you. And it's not about assessment. Assessment is a how. The why has to do with, let's just imagine the cumulative missions that you represent and imagine them flourishing and being fulfilled and think about, think of the difference that would make in the world. Now we're getting to a why. Too many organizations, I think, neglect. They think about assessment in a way that doesn't help them with the why. And so I'd like to uh, sort of present a, a, a thesis to you and then try it out with you. And I'll tell you where it came from. Um, as, you, as you heard um, from, from Joanne that I, um, I was a teacher for the first uh, 20, <coughs> years, 25 years of my career. And then I, uh, my wife and I founded a school called the Mountain School, a semester program for 11th graders, interdisciplinary environmental studies, and we were spoiled rotten for being at any other school. So there we were in our mid-40s and we were unhirable because uh, we, our, our, we felt schools should be joyful and every student should want to be there and every teacher want to be there. We were spoiled. So uh, we said, what the hell are we going to do? Actually, you parents will be interested to know that we had two young boys, eight and ten, and we, they raised, grew up on a hill farm in Vermont. So we picked up and the family moved to Ghana. We lived for half a year in Ghana. These little white boys, these little mm. Vermont white boys lived in the village and, and it's now, it's made them fearless adults. Um, but I didn't know what, I figured um, I, in a way we'd sort of peaked early in the world of education. And then the opportunity to uh, be president of the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation came along. Reminds you what a funny field philanthropy is, right? that my first day on the job in philanthropy would be as president of the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. <laughs> so it, it's not a field that has a professional training ground. Its training ground is the world it tries to uh, affect. So anyway, I went down, but I still had my essential uh, teacherly persona on, and um, so there weren't any students hanging out, but there were the executive directors, the board chairs, the staff, all the people of the organizations that Dodge supported. So I sort of pulled them together and said, well, what do we need to learn together? And that and launched this uh, technical assistance program. This was uh, almost 20 years ago. It was 18 years ago. And, um, and it's still going strong. And what, I, what I'm bringing to you today is actually uh, a distillation of what I feel I've learned in the 18 years of working with um, social sector leaders, primarily in New Jersey, but now since I've left the Dodge Foundation around the country. I did get to distill it into a book called The Social Profit Handbook, which I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit from later. Um, but I want to go back to the why and actually tell you where my title came from. Because I think the why for all of us has to do with this noun. But I'm just guessing, when you see the noun profit, you have a picture in your head. I'm guessing. What's the picture? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what I would have done because I couldn't have rearranged the slides so quickly. 
when people see the word profit, they almost assume it doesn't need an adjective. They mean financial profit. And they picture dollar bills or coins or something, financial profit. Well, the world is in mad pursuit of financial profit. But what the world needs is social profit. And that's what we, we're in the business of. All, all of you in the, in the uh, social profit sector, all of you who worked for organizations that right up to this moment you called nonprofits. Let's call them what they are, not what they're not. They're social profit organizations. <coughs> social profit organizations. Now this is a whole little sidelight we may get into later in some questions and answers. But I actually think, beginning with the word nonprofit, we accept a sort of a, a, sort of a, a subdued status. We actually ac accept the notion that we're supposed to be um, kind of penniless. That it makes sense that um, if you really manage well and have a surplus, that you actually have funders, even funders, who go, oh, well, they must not need us anymore. <laughs> Completely crazy. Because we, we get cast that it's about money. It's not about money. It's about social profit. Now, when you bring up social profit as an idea and an ideal, if people want to shoot it down or if they want to be cantankerous, what's, what do they say right away? But you can't measure that. <clears throat> One thing you have to say about financial profit is you can measure it. People know. You know, they know how much money they've made or lost. They can do it right to the cent. That's because we have a unit of measure, a standard unit of measure. Well, when people say you can't measure that, that's sort of their way of saying, but you don't have a unit of measure. I would like to um, spend a little time with you today so that if you have this conversation, you know what to say next right to the person who says you can't measure that as if the conversation was over and it has to do uh, with the way we think um, this is the way your brain uh, works this is a little drawing from a book by a, a cognitive scientist named Daniel Willingham and uh, he says that the, this burgeoning field of cognitive science has taught us that the environment is constantly asking us for uh, responses, for choices, for uh, to react. And what happens when the, when the environment comes at us, our working memory processes it. Our working memory we sometimes call our consciousness. And one of the things that cognitive science has told us is that it's finite. Now, is this beginning to sound familiar? That your working memory could actually get overwhelmed? <laughs> That's right. It literally, when you say, I can't, uh, my brain can't hold another thing, you're right. Not your whole brain, but your working memory can't hold another thing. So how in the world do human beings cope when the environment is constantly coming at us and asking us to react? What do you do? What are we going to do about this? What do you think? Well, the working memory has amazing access to this much bigger thing called the long-term memory. And uh, for my generation, um, I would, my analogy would be it's a file drawer. <laughs> For my older son, it might be a hard disk. For my younger son, it might be the cloud. Who knows what it's gonna be, like, but, but the main thing is that it's got a huge uh, capacity. Now, I'd like to illustrate how quickly this works, okay? Please don't be shy, I'm gonna ask you a question. That's what this is. I'm going to ask you a question. Your working memory is going to check and see if you know it. Answer as quickly as you can. What color is a polar bear? White. white. Now, isn't that amazing? You didn't have white on your mind. Where did it come from? You checked. You went down and you had a little file there that had a picture of a polar bear in it. You've got an amazing amount of knowledge in your long-term memory that's accessible to you, all you need is the question. Let's do it again. Ready? What's five times seven? Now, when you went down, I, I don't think there was a folder there that said 30, 
said 35. What was it, 35? It said 35. There wasn't a folder that said 35. What, what did the folder say? I went past the folder. You went past it to yeah. what? To the answer. Well, what was the answer? How, do you, how did you know the answer? Third grade teacher making learning. <laughs> <laughs> you just you could compute it. Just, the fog said yeah, multiplication. You, know you know how to do. You know how, you know why you know it because you know how to multiply. Okay, don't sell yourself short. You've got a skill. <laughs> you know how to multiply. Now I will admit that there are some people who never learn to multiply, but they memorized the times tables, right? So, so they went down, and the folder said times tables, Mrs. Johnson, and, and there, and so they went, oh, 35. Um, I'm going to do it again. Here, I'm going to. Here's a question. Answer as quickly as you can. What does this mean? So, the harmony. So, so, good, good, thinking it through. What, here's what's happening. You, you did the exact same thing on the first two questions. The thing is you didn't access a file right away. You're flipping around. You're flipping through the file drawer now going, what does this mean? And you're saying, well, this note makes me think of this. This, uh, this scene makes me think of this. 